chapter 25 is covering the heredity and um, some hereditary conditions. There are um, mentioned, the heredity is actually mentioned many, many years um, back. Uh, it was mentioned for the first time in the Old Testament. And um, there are actually numerous references about it. Um, in addition to that, it's it's something that was fascinating the humankind for, for um, centuries. And this is because it's fascinating to see how um, various traits, both uh, in terms of behaviors and both um, and also in terms of um, our phenotypical or how we look like, uh, they are transmitted from uh, from parents to the offspring. Um, in the um, 19th century, um, the first uh, time that uh, heredity was more um, uh, theoretically, in a more methodical type, uh, investigated was uh, when the Austrian monk Gregor Mendel um, was exploring um, the characteristics and the relationship between the parents and their progenies. Um, and he did his experiments on uh, on peas. Uh, so this chapter will um, will cover the elements of heredity and hereditary diseases. The overview for this lecture will be. Um, we'll cover the genes and chromosomes uh, with describing what represent the dominant and re uh, recessive alleles. The chromosome distribution uh, will go back and we'll review the meiosis type of uh, cell divisions and we'll describe the Punnett score squares. Uh, we'll talk about the sex determination and about sex linked traits. Uh, in terms of hereditary traits, we'll look at the gene expression gene mutations, and uh, the mitochondrial inheritance type. We'll discuss some genetic diseases in terms of types, causes, uh, and we'll uh, give some examples. And we'll also look into treatment and prevention of hereditary conditions. Please take a moment and stop this presentation in order to review the learning objectives. We'll start by discussing the genes and chromosomes. and. Um, if we need to define the genes, uh, the genes are um, in fact some segments of DNA um, and they are contained throughout the structure of the chromosomes. Um, again, the chromosomes, if you remember, are contained in the nucleus of each cell. There are some cells in our body um, that they do not have any type of DNA because they um, do not have a nucleus um, and those are the mature red uh, blood cells. The main role for the genes is to um, provide control over uh, manufacturing of proteins. And uh, among the proteins, especially the enzymes that are um, essential uh, for the chemical reactions that happen inside our body. Um, in addition to that, beside the enzymes, uh, enzymes, the uh, proteins will also um, be synthesized by, based on the information in the genes for um, those proteins that will be hormones or growth factors or structural materials. Uh, when we are looking at the type of divisions of cells in our body, we see that uh, the somatic um, cells, those that are make up for the body cells, um, they divide through a process that is called uh, mitosis. In this process, the DNA in each cell um, will be replicated so we'll end up having a double number of chromosomes that will be equally distributed to the daughter cells. In other words, we start with an uh, two N numbers of chromosome and each of the cells will receive the same, will end up having the same two N numbers of chromosome. Um, on the other hand, uh, in the, um, in the gametes, in the, sexual types of cells, the division uh, will be done through meiosis, and as a result of that, we'll have only half of the uh, chromosomes uh, from, um, from one parent cell. So from 46 chromosomes, we'll end up having only uh, 23 chromosomes, having only half of the number. Whenever um, a new individual is formed through the process of fertilization of an egg by, um, by a sperm, each, uh, each parent will provide to the genetic luggage of the offspring half of their genetic materials.
we'll continue talking about genes now by describing what the alleles are. And if you'll click on the red link, this will take you to a different movie that um, explains um, the concept of um, alleles uh, as well. So we know by now that the genes um, will come in pairs. And the same trait, the same characteristic, will be encoded on a gene um, on what is called alleles. So those will be variations of the same gene for the same trait. Whenever this allele is uh, similar, is identical, it will be called a homozygous. And if it's different, it will be called a heterozygous. We have another concept here, and the concept is the is described as the concept uh, concept of domination, and that will give information on how those alleles will express themselves. So let's say we have one that is called a dominant. Just by going by the definition of the word dominant, the dominant allele will always express its characteristics. Um, it can be either homozygous or heterozygous. It can be inherited from the mother, from the father, or from both of them. Regardless, we need just one dominant allele in order to have that trait uh, expressed in an individual. So if we have a dominant one, obviously we have a non-dominant one. And the non-dominant allele is called the recessive allele. In order for a recessive allele, because it's a shyer type of or a weaker type of a genetic trait, in order for this recessive allele to express itself, I need to have a um, situation when I have a homozygous. I have to have both of the parents need to pass the recessive allele in, in, in order for that to be expressed. Otherwise, if the recessive allele will be paired with a dominant allele from the other parent, um, then this recessive being a shyer one or a weaker one will not going to express itself and the dominant one will be expressed. In other words, in order to have the expression of a recessive allele, I will need to have it inherited from both. Both parents need to pass it over. Any characteristic that can be observed in an individual or can be tested is like a function that we can test. It's considered a phenotype uh, part of an individual. As an example, the eye color, uh, the blood type, um, all those are elements that um, are examples of the phenotype. So whenever someone has a recessive phenotype, the genetic makeup for that, and now the genetic makeup is called the genotype, should be homozygous recessive. When a dominant phenotype will appear, the person's genotype can be either homozygous or heterozygous because the dominant gene will always express itself. In other words, um, a recessive allele will not only ex be expressed if it's in the presence of a dominant allele. An individual who shows no evidence of a trait but has a recessive allele called the trait will be called a carrier. In other words, they can pass it over. It can happen that they that this gene will be passed over. And in the situation that it will meet another recessive allele in the offspring, that trait will be um, expressed. We'll read you now the, um, the meiosis process and the, uh, the gametes, the reproductive cells, the ova and the spermatozoa, uh, will be produced uh, through the process of meiosis. In this process, the chromosome numbers will be um, cut in half. In, as a result of that, each reproductive cell will have only 23 chromosomes instead of the 46 of a normal uh, body cell. And this is because in order to produce an individual, a new body, a new organism, half of the genetic material will come from the mother and half from the father. So it makes sense to have the gametes those that will carry over our traits to have only half of our luggage. The process will start just like the mitosis starts with a replication of the chromosome. Uh, the chromosomes will be um, placed up and lined up across the center of the cell. And instead of having a random distribution of the 46 chromosomes, um, that the way that it occurs in the mitosis, um, in the first meio meiotic division or meiosis one, those 
two members of each chromosome will pair into separate cells. During the second meiotic division, meiosis II, separate strains of the duplicated chromosomes will distribute each strand to an individual gamete. So, in other words, from a single cell that multiply itself and will um, reproduce, will uh, copy, will dupli duplicate um, the 46 chromosomes, I will have as a result of 92 chromosomes that will enter meiosis. As a result of that, I will end up, instead of having two daughter cells, I will have four daughter cells, each of them having 23 different chromosomes. So as a result of that, in each chromosome pair that each of us are creating in our gamut, one of those chromosomes initially will be inherited from the father and one from the mother. So it's important to know that this separation of the chromosome pairs will be so random that each of the gamete, each of the uh, reproductive cells that we are producing will receive a mixture of maternal and paternal chromosomes. And it's kind of a reassortment of the chromosomes that will lead and increase the variety of the population. And this is the explanation why no two children in a family will resemble each other totally, like, like being identical, similar to identical twins, um, and they will share only some traits in common. So again, the process will start with a cell that contains 46 chromosomes that will all duplicate, ending up with 96 chromosomes that will uh, further will divide into four. We end up with four daughter cells, each having 23 chromosomes. In order to understand how the transmission of the genes is possible um, in terms of combination of alleles, uh, we will look at usually the uh, geneticists and um, also us, we can look at what is called the Punnett square. And this because we do that because the, um, the genes, especially those that are coded by just two genes, but some other traits in our body may be coded by more than just two genes. They can be uh, four uh, or more genes that contribute to the same uh, characteristic. They are following a very mathematical pattern of combination of those two options of the dominant and the recessive allele. Um, we are using as a classic example, the ability of an individual of test tasting uh, and feeling the bitter taste of, a, of an organic substance that usually is not found in food, um, has a bitter taste and it's um, totally unharmful to our body. So that's why we can use it for this type of um, um, experiment, let's call it like that, or, um, or testing. It's called PTC or phenyltiocarbamate. In order to be able to taste the, um, this uh, um, chemical uh, substance, um, we need to have at least one dominant gene. And let's see what happens if we have both a mother and a father that they are heterozygous. They have both the dominant and the non-dominant gene in their, um, in their um, um, body type. They can create as a result of the fact that they are heterozygous, they can create either uh, an ovum that has the dominant trait and an ovum that has the non-dominant, the recessive one, or they can create a, a sperm that they, it has the dominant and one that has the non-dominant um, gene. As a combination of those two, you can see that we'll have as a, an end result, one individual, one baby, and we are talking now in theory as a possibility, we are talking probabilities here. They can have one out of four babies will be totally dominant and will be a taster because this is a dominant gene that inherits both dominant genes uh, from both the mother and the father. We'll have two babies or two in four chances, 50% chance to have also a taster baby. But in this case, this one will be a heterozygous one that carries one dominant and one non-dominant allele. And also, they may have 
one in four chance to have a non-tester baby. And this baby inherits from both parents the non-dominant, the recessive allele. So in order, uh, so because of that, they will not going to be able to perceive uh, the taste. In other words, whenever we are looking at a trait that is a combination of uh, dominant and non-dominant, we'll have a 25% chance to have a baby that is totally dominant, homozygous dominant. We'll have a 50% chance to have a heterozygous um, um, showing the trait um, a baby. And we have a 25% chance to have a recessive um, individual that will not going to exhibit the trait. We are looking now into um, the sex determination. And for the sex determination, we have the same Punnett square that we will use. Um, as opposed to that, we know that um, female gender is defined as a double X a pair of two X chromosomes while the male gender is defined as a pair of an X and a Y chromosome. The large uh, female chromosomes will be um, a little, the Y, I'm sorry, the X chromosome is larger as opposed to the small male Y chromosome that is uh, smaller. We are looking now at the combination, the possible combinations that we have by, um, when we are looking at a couple in terms of trying to see if we can um, forecast if they will have a boy or a girl. And if you look into that, you can see that from the mother's side, all the ovas will carry only the X chromosome. There is no other option because we have a pair of two X chromosomes. No matter how we split them, we'll have an X chromosome in an ova. On the other hand, on the sperm, from the father, we can have either an X chromosome or a Y chromosome present in the sperm because the, the chromosomes will take only one either the X or the Y chromosome from the father. So if we put that in a Punnett square and we are looking at the combination, you can see how by combining those two, we have a 50-50 chance in a family by looking at a couple for them to have either a girl or a boy. Now we'll stay a little bit longer with the, uh, with the sex chromosome and we'll define what is a sex-linked trait. Uh, whenever there is a trait that is carried by the sex chromosome, that will be called the sex-linked trait. By now, you know that the uh, Y chromosome is way smaller than the X chromosome. The sperm is a smaller cell than the ova. So it's obviously that most of the traits that are sex-linked will be carried by the X chromosome. Um, and when they are carried by the X chromosome, they are called uh, X-linked. Um, examples for that. Uh, will be hemophilia, uh, some forms of baldness, and what is called the red-green color blindness. It's not the true blindness. Uh, if you remember, in our um, on our retina, we are supposed to have three different basic types of cones. Uh, in the people that have this condition that is called blindness, instead of having three different types of cones that will, I will identify the basic colors, they have only two. And there is a shared quality for one red cone from one cone, a type of cone cells that will also uh, see the red and the green. And that's where the confusion is not that the person is blind, it's just is not able to discriminate between the red and green color because the same um, cone cell will receive the information. So if we say that those particular traits are carried by the X chromosome, they will show up, they will be um, they will exhibit uh, their quality exclusively in males because they are not partnered by another X chromosome like in uh, females. And in a female, they will be uh, shadowed by the normal chromosome that is the, the second X chromosome that will be normal. Um, and the reason for that is mainly because those traits are recessive and once they are not counterbalanced by a dominant uh, trait, they will know uh, not show up. So a male who has only recessive alleles for a trait that is carried by an X chromosome will exhibit those. Um, in order for a female to exhibit those uh, traits, she will need to inherit from both the mother and the father the recessive gene. Um, and it's a little bit harder in terms of um, chances, statistical chances. 
the daughters of a man that has an X-linked disorder will always be a carrier for that. May or may not exhibit. If the mother doesn't have it, she will may not exhibit it, but she will always carry that X-linked disorder and it will pass it over um, to, the, um, to the offspring. And that's an explanation why uh, hemophilia that was considered the, the king's disorders back in France and also in the, uh, in the white Russia, um, it was carried by the females in the family, but was exhibited well, will exhibit it, um, its trait, the tendency for bleeding only in the male offspring. What is the term for all the variants of a particular gene? A, chromosomes, B, ribosomes, C, nucleotides, or D, alleles? The term for all the variants of a particular gene are called alleles. talking about hereditary traits and we are looking now into um, what are those observable uh, traits and they can be eye color or skin color or um, hair color and facial features and and will be some that are not genetic they are determined by our environment as for an example the language that we spoke um, and in most of our traits will be in fact an a combination of genetics and environment. Um, the type of inheritance, the way that the traits are passed over to us is most of the time called a multifactorial one. There will be a multiple combination of genes that are contributing to who we are. Um, and that helps him to produce what is called a wide range of variation. And that's why we are not similar. We are not identical. Very seldom uh, traits will be a single gene inheritance. This is very, very uncommon. We'll need to define now the gene expression. And this means uh, what is the effect of a gene in an individual phenotype? In other words, whatever is coded in our genetics, how obvious will be that in how we look, how we behave, uh, how our body um, acts. And the gene expression may be influenced by a variety of factors. Uh, and that, uh, that can be related to uh, the individual's gender or the presence of other genes. And I'll give an example, the boldness. It can be inherited, the, sex, the, the gene for boldness may be inherited by either males or females. However, the trait will exhibit itself mostly in males and this is because there is a combination with the male sex hormone. Also, the gene expression will be different depending on the development and the age of the individual. Um, the best example for that would be the fact that we have two hemoglobin genes. Uh, one in the stage of a fetus, one gene is more expressed than the other. Once we get born, the hemoglobin, the hemoglobin S, that is the fetal type of hemoglobin, will change to the adult to the um, adult type of hemoglobin that we have on our um, outside the womb um, existence. Um, another example of factors that may influence the expression of a gene will be the environment. Um, the example for that will be the freckles, um, and the freckles will show up on the skin of an individual only when they are exposed to sun. Uh, they do not show up if we are um, uh, being inside the house, if it's overcast outside, um, if it's cold outside, in a cold environment, an overcast environment, the freckles will not show up on the face of an individual. However, the same individual that has the gene for freckles, once exposed to sun, they will, um, they will show up. Um, We'll have also what is called a um, variant of uh, dominance. And this happens when this dominance is not such a clear cut kind of uh, event. Uh, some of the genes may express themselves together um, kind of in the same way and they will um, not um, overcome each other. And uh, this is called a co-dominant. The best example for that is the AB genotype that will result in an AB phenotype both the A and B antigens will be present on the surface of the 
red blood cells. In addition to that, a person that is a heterozygous uh, for a certain trait may show some intermediate expression, expression of that trait, uh, and that will be called an incomplete um, dominant. And we have some types of hemoglobin uh, that they are uh, not the proper type, however, they can uh, perform uh, the function up to a certain point, and we see them in Coase disorder or sickle cell anemia, uh, and this is because there is a recessive allele of the hemoglobin that will express itself. We define a mutation as any change in a gene or in a chromosome. Mutation can occur in different instances. It can um, occur was, as it calls as, as a spontaneously change in the, uh, in the genes or in the chromosomes, or it, they may be the result of the action of an agent. And the agents can be ionizing radiation or chemicals, toxic pr uh, product. And when the mutation is um, under the effect of one of those agents, the agent is called a mutagen or a mutagenic agent. Um, there are some situations when the small changes in the genes, they are the result of a, an error in the um, multiplication of the cell, in the copying uh, sequence during the DNA synthesis. And those are the small uh, errors, the small changes. Whenever there is a large mutation uh, in which portion of a chromosome or the entire chromosome um, is gained or lost, we have additions or loss of genetic material, but in large amounts, um, that usually occurs during the meiosis, when all the chromosomes are kind of sticking to that together, they reassort themselves and get redistributed to the two new cells. And then um, those thread-like uh, chromosomes that intertwine and exchange segments, um, they can do that. And you can see in this image, they can have uh, parts of them, especially at the ends of the chromosomes can become interchanged in the uh, chromosomes. Uh, when those losses, duplication, rearrangements of the genetic material will involve a single gene, um, that will be a limited change. However, they can uh, involve big portions of the chromosomes or the whole chromosome. Whenever that mutation happens in an ovum or a spermatozoan, as a result of that, because that is transmitted to an offspring, um, that can um, profoundly influence the development of the, uh, of the offspring. We have two types of, of mutations that we see in nature. We have what is called a beneficial mutation um, that will um, increase the ability of an organism. And when, I, when I'm talking now about genetics, do not think only about humans. Think about everything in the nature that has a genetic material, including bacteria and viruses. And now you can understand how viruses are mutating themselves because they are copying themselves and they may make mistakes. And in the process of making a mistake, they become a different individual, a different type of virus. Bacteria, on the other hand, they will try to overcome the action of antibiotics and will try to adapt to a new environment when, where antibiotics are trying to kill them and they may change their genetics and transfer to the offsprings, to the new cells that they are creating, the capability, the ability of resist certain antibiotics. So most recessive traits uh, result from some kind of loss of function. And uh, in the mutated gene, that will encode a protein that is not going to be produced or if the protein is produced, we're not going to be able, it's uh, malformed, it's not having the right structure, and will not carry out its normal function. So what happens in a heterozygous individual? They have one normal copy of the gene and one mutated. The normal copy will guide the synthesis. So in because always when we are producing something where we are showing one of our traits in our body, only one of those couple of genes, our body is trying to be redundant to protect us. That's why we have two copies. So at least one will be functional. So in those that they have a mutated copy and the normal one, the normal one will exhibit its function and will guide, let's say, the synthesis of the normal protein. And that's why that individual will have a normal phenotype, will have a normal function. So 
whenever I have two individuals that they are both heterozygous, they have a one in four chance to have a child that will inherit it, will inherit both of the mutated, both of the malfunctioning copies of the gene. And as a result of that, they will have a, a, mal, a, a loss of function for that protein or not even secreting that protein as an example. Um, another example of um, mutations will be a gain of function. Um, and in this case, the uh, typical example is the, uh, the cancer that will result from a mutation that will increase the growth factor receptor genes for that cell. And that cell will mutate, will replicate, will uh, malfunction, and will develop into a tissue that doesn't resemble the original tissue anymore because its ability to change, uh, change its shape under the growth uh, factor um, influence. What so far, we described only what happens with the uh, chromosomes at the level of the nucleus, because this is the main place where we can find the genetic material in a cell. However, um, we have another place uh, in our body that contains uh, genetic material, and that will be uh, mitochondria. And there is a theory that says that mitochondria, um, early in the evolution of life, was um, was considered a completely separate um, type of organism. And um, at a certain point in our evolution merged with the cells that have already had have their own DNA. Um, and um, the mitochondria will also contain its own DNA. And uh, the mitochondrial DNA can mutate by itself, just like any other DNA, let's say the nuclear DNA can. Um, one interesting thing about the mitochondria is that we inherit our DNA in the mitochondria only from our mothers. So whenever we are looking at the uh, mitochondria, we can say for sure, we can define back just by looking at that DNA, our um, chain of ancestors on our mother's side, mother to mother to mother to mother. Uh, and this is because it's passed um, in, the cytoplasm, in the cytoplasm of the, uh, of the ovum. That's the explanation. If you remember, the, uh, sperma, uh, the spermatozoan, they do have mitochondria in their body. However, once they penetrate the ovum, they just release the genetic material inside uh, the ovum. They do not uh, transfer their mitochondria. We'll discuss now some congenital and uh, hereditary conditions. Um, we call genetic condition any disorder that involves um, um, defect at the level of the gene. Not all genetic disorders are hereditary. Some um, may happen during the maturation of the sex cells. Uh, some changes at the level of the uh, genetic material can um, go um, wrong during the maturation of the uh, gamete. Also, some of those genetic conditions uh, may happen while the embryo starts to develop. So in other words, uh, congenital represents present at birth, while hereditary means that was genetically, genetically transmitted or transmissible. Once you have a hereditary condition, you inherited it from your parents and you can pass it over to your offspring. While a congenital uh, condition uh, was developed uh, while in womb in the, pro in the process of developing of the offspring. You have here um, in this picture, you have the example of um, what is called the um, tulipus, um, where it, or the club foot, where you have this deformity of the foot that is uh, considered being a congenital condition while uh, the other one is called the polydactyly. You can see that um, this baby has six fingers, um, and this is considered a hereditary condition. There are some places in the South America that they have um, this condition, and, and you can see that all, every single finger is perfectly formed, and it has the whole structure of a finger in terms of uh, soft tissues and bones and nerves and uh, vascular supply. So, um, 
most of the congenital deformities and birth defects may have what is called a not known cause. Uh, in some cases, we do understand that certain infections and toxins um, can be uh, carried from the mother's blood to the placenta to the fetal circulation and can compromise the development of the fetus. Um, any factor or agent that can cause any type of abnormal development is called a teratogen agent. Uh, and we have a few of those that we know by now that can produce um, um, malformations in, um, in fetuses. Uh, one would be the um, rubella or the German missiles, that um, contagious viral infection that can be extremely mild disease um, in most of the adults and even in, in children can be a very mild condition. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a virus that exhibits itself with a little bit of uh, runny nose, with a skin rash, um, with inflammation of the lymph nodes. However, if the mother uh, is um, contracting the condition during the first three months of development, there is a very high chance, up to 40%, that the fetus will have um, defects of the eye in terms of cataract, hearing loss, uh, brain and heart um, development issues. In addition to that, we know about ionizing radiation and uh, toxins, um, some environmental um, agents as mercury, um, certain phenols, um, they are all disrupting the genetic um, um, organization of the fetus. Another uh, teratogen agent is the um, alcohol, and in addition to that is the cigarette smoking. As a result of that, we have a growth retardation in the babies, and um, uh, we observe a lot of low birth weight um, babies that are way smaller than they are expected to be at birth. That's why the main recommendation is to avoid any type of alcohol intake during pregnancy as well as no um, smoking. In, in uh, the case of the alcohol uh, consumption during the uh, pregnancy, uh, the condition that is associated with that is called fetal alcohol syndrome, where the baby will have, just like in this picture that you see here, will have um, facial features that are malformed, um, you will see a stunted growth, cardiac and nervous system disorders, and uh, definitely um, uh, behavior problems as a result of that. Spina bifida uh, is a condition that um, is characterized by an, an incomplete closure of the spine, and through that opening, um, it can be the spinal cord or its membranes or a combination of both may project to the outside. And you can see here, uh, the normal development of the um, spinal cord will be by having the arch, the posterior arch of the vertebra being complete. In the uh, patients that they have the spina bifida, you see that the posterior arch in part of the vertebra, not all of them, usually in the lumbar part of the um, um, body, there will be, the vertebra will be incomplete and there will be a projection outside of the meninges. Uh, with the cerebrospinal fluid, they may or may not be covered by skin. Um, and in sometimes there will be, depending on the how large the defect is, uh, even the spinal cord can project outside and uh, can be exposed to injury. Uh, most of the time it's a result of in, an inadequate intake of folic acid or vitamin B during the first stages of the pregnancy. Other genetic disorders. So we start here, and you see in the first picture on the left, picture A, you see a baby with um, uh, uh, Down syndrome. This is called also the trisomy 21, and is the result of an extra chromosome. Um, the 21 pair, instead of having just two chromosomes, um, in those babies will present with an extra one, and is the result of um, of a fertilization of an egg that has both copies, the egg, instead of splitting the pair of the chromosome 21, will keep the whole pair. And by being fertilized uh, by a sperm that will bring another chromosome that is 21, um, those babies will result in having um, three chromosomes for that pair. They, in terms of the phenotype, they pretty much all of them have the characteristic of that they kind of resemble each other. They 
they look pretty much the same in terms of phenotype. If you look at their faces, you can recognize very quick a Down syndrome baby. Um, they will have this kind of facial features that are uh, very similar. They have very low immune system. Um, they have heart conditions. They uh, have a high risk of developing leukemia. Um, they have a poor muscle tone sometimes. It has been considered that they have lower into intellectual function. However, nowadays, because we are putting a little bit more work into understanding this condition and working with this type of babies, we see that um, they actually are not having low intellectual functions. They have a different way of gaining information and developing. Um, the uh, chance of having a Down syndrome baby will increase with the uh, mother's age, and is considered that the risk is high in women that are conceiving over age 35. Um, and that's why those patients need to be screened uh, for a Down syndrome baby during the pregnancy. Um, and the um, reason for that is that uh, with aging, the ability of a female of producing normal gametes will um, decrease. The second picture, the B1, uh, it presents you with a different uh, genetic syndrome. It's called Klinefelter. Um, it occurs in 1 in 600 males and um, represent um, as a malformation. You can see that it's a sex-related one. We have a double XY genetics. Um, it's the, um, the way that it happens, it's a combination between um, either an egg that has two X or a, a spermatozoa that has both the X and the Y chromosome in it. And as a result of that, we have this type of male phenotype because we have the Y chromosome. So they will have the male phenotype. However, they will be infertile, uh, will be extremely tall and have a lot of cognitive and motor uh, impairment. On your far right side, uh, picture C uh, presents you with another syndrome that is called the Turner syndrome. And this is the result of an union of an X gamete with a gamete that has no sex chromosome. It's either the ovum that will have no uh, gender chromosome or the sperm that will have no gender chromosome. And as a result of that, they are called an X0. Because they have one X, phenotypically, they will be a female. Uh, in most cases for Turner syndrome, they will result in a miscarriage very early in the pregnancy, um, in very early stages of, stages of development. But whenever they show up, they will have this very short stature, um, will have a webbed uh, neck, and they may have cardiovascular and other uh, developmental disorders. However, phenotypically, they are female. Now, we are looking into um, what happens if we have a dominant gene disorder. Um, so those are called familial or hereditary um, conditions. They may be passed either by the mother or the father uh, with the ovum or the sperm genetic uh, material. Most of the times, depending on what type of condition, they either can be dominant or recessive. Yeah. As an example, we have the Huntington disease, which is a progressive degenerative disorder um, that will show rapid involuntary muscle activities and mental deterioration. They are losing control over their body. They do not have any um, voluntary control over their muscles. Uh, this condition is interesting because will not going to appear until about age 40. The patients will develop and will be normal up to late in life, late adulthood, um, and will start to show the first symptoms in late adulthood that will lead to death in about 10 to 15 years uh, later. Because it's a genetic condition, um, there is no cure for that. And the only thing that we can do in the families that they know that they are carrier for the genes, and this is the dominant um, condition, um, we are uh, trying to test them and do genetic counseling in terms of uh, decisions, what to do uh, if they can pass over the gene to their uh, offspring. Another uh, dominant uh, disorder with the Marfan syndrome, which is a connective tissue disorder with um, usually the patients with Marfan syndrome will have a hyperelasticity and the lack of the, their collagen is not having the correct consistency. So they are tall, thin, they have heart defects, eye issues, a whole combination of 
tissues in all the systems and organs that will have um, collagen tissue uh, in them. We have now the recessive uh, genetic condition. In the recessive ones, uh, we'll need to have tube recessive genes in order for the phenotypical trait to show up. And in those cases, the gene will be carried by both parents. Both parents may be normal and may show no physical traits of the condition. However, they have the gene and they can pass it and they have a chance, one chance, a 25% chance uh, to have an offspring that will show the condition. Uh, one example is fetil, uh, phenylketonuria or the PKU, where there is a lack of a certain enzyme that will prevent the proper metabolism of phenylalanine. Um, the phenylalanine is a very common amino acid in our, in our diet, and by not having the enzyme that is required for processing it, the phenylalanine will accumulate in the infant's blood, will show up in the urine, however, it will lead to accumulation in the uh, nervous system and will impair the development of the, um, of the nervous system. It will lead to mental retardation very quick in the existence of the child, uh, that may become quickly irreversible uh, by age of two. That's why we are routinely screening all the newborns for uh, PKU, and the treatment is to uh, remove completely the phenylalanine from the diet of those children in order to prevent uh, future um, um, maldevelopment uh, of the nervous system. Another condition is the sickle cell anemia. Again, it needs to have the gene passed from both parents is um, common in the uh, black population. And um, it's common also in the uh, populations that are coming from the Mediterranean uh, region. Another condition that is this time way more common in the white population is the cystic fibrosis. Um, that will be the cystic fibrosis is characterized by an excessive thickened uh, secretion in the bronchi, in the intestine, in the pancreatic duct, all those parts that are, are all the exocrine glands. And by um, because the, uh, the secretions are so, so thick, will result in obstruction of the duct. The, um, in addition to that, for cystic fibrosis, there is a loss of salt. Um, there are some... Um, intimate mechanisms of um, sodium metabolism that are compromised in this type of patient. Tysax um, represents a condition that is very common in Eastern European Jews, in Ashkenazi Jews, um, that will result in uh, an accumulation and deposits of fat at the level of the central nervous system and retina. Um, usually the um, the babies are not surviving more than a couple of years. Uh, the progressive muscular um, atrophies will be um, a progressive loss of normal muscle function, uh, especially from the uh, waist uh, uh, down in the beginning, but may progress upwards later. And um, as a general clinical picture, what you will see is called a floppy baby syndrome. Um, they have no tonus, they are not able to move, and ultimately, um, they were not going to be able to uh, breathe adequately on their own. Another recessive condition is the albinism that affects the melanocytes that are producing the pigment and melanin, um, in addition to um, of having a very light color of the skin. Um, the hair will be white, it will not darken with age, um, in addition to that, they may have, um, their um, iris may have no color as well, and as a result of that, they may have visual disturbances, uh, an abnormal sensitivity to light, which is photophobia. Uh, they may have myopia. Uh, fragile X syndrome is um, a condition that leads to mental retardation in males. Um, it is an X-linked recessive disorder where it's called fragile X because there is a fragile site on the arm that can be lost in the um, repli uh, reproduction uh, copying of this um, chromosome. Uh, osteogenesis imperfecta or the brittle bone disease is also um, an inherited disorder uh, where the patients will exhibit multiple fractures um, immediately um, in their life, even, even um, 
after they are born as an infant, um, and they are associated with uh, sometimes with disorders of the skin and muscles and bones. Uh, neurofibromatosis um, will have multiple masses um, of um, they grow often on a, they are pedunculated, they are growing on a stalk sometimes, and they are associated with uh, a high incidence of cancer. Now, what can you do when we have a patient or a family that has um, a disease that is considered genetic? There is a large list of genetic condition that we uh, know by now. Uh, and the first thing that we can do is called genetic counseling. Um, what we can do is prevention of transmitting of those traits into um, into uh, the offspring of a certain family, especially if we know that um, they carry a certain um, a certain condition. In addition to that, what we can do is to do education for prospective parents that are older than 35. Um, again, for those that they have a history of genetic disorders, um, and especially for those that are searching for some form of uh, fertility treatment. So how do we do the genetic counseling? Um, we start by taking a a very accurate, complete, and in-depth uh, family history by looking at uh, all the relatives that the couple or the individual uh, knows about. And we are asking about their age, any kind of specific diseases. When did that disease start? Uh, what is their health status? What was the cause of that for all of those uh, individuals? We are looking into their ethnic origins because we know that some genetic diseases will be more predominant in certain ethnic groups. Uh, based on that, we create, and you see an example here, we can create a pedigree chart uh, where we are so, uh, showing the filiation, how uh, filly means um, 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 offsprings, uh, means uh, children in, um, in Latin. So we are showing the filiation, the relationship between uh, all the um, different generation. And you can see how we started at one, that we have the... the um, so-called the grandparents, and you can see the F2 is the parents with the F3 being the offspring, being the children. And you can see how we can color them different in terms of uh, they do or they do not have show the condition. We can uh, we show the male as a square and the female as a circle, as a convention. So you can see how from two families, that in each of those, we have a grandparent that are carrying the trait for cystic fibrosis. We end up with a couple that both of the parents are carrying the gene for cystic fibrosis. And as a result of that, they do have a chance of having a one in four chance for a child to be a daughter with cystic fibrosis or a one in uh, four chance for them to have a boy that is carrying and has cystic fibrosis. So bottom line from this combination, you have, um, you can you can result in children that have, they are not just carrier, but they do exhibit the condition. When we do the screening, we already have someone um, that is pregnant, we can do what is called the prenatal screening. And most of this pre-screening, this prenatal screening is done during the first trimester. Some of it uh, is uh, performed in the second trimester. In the uh, first trimester, we do an ultrasound that will measure what is called the nuchal transparency test. We are doing an ultrasound and we are measuring um, the space at the level of the uh, neck of the baby in between the, um, at the level of the development of the spinal cord. And we are measuring that transparency. We can do, uh, and measure the pregnancy-associated plasma protein tests that are uh, trying to identify uh, abnormal levels of protein that are produced by placenta in early uh, pregnancy. And if they are abnormal, they, uh, their uh, meaning is that there is something abnormal genetically with the baby. We can measure the human chorionic gonadotropin, which is the main hormone that is produced by the placenta during pregnancy. Again, high levels of this hormone may signal to us that there is something wrong genetically with the baby. During the second trimester, we have other tests that we can do. 
uh, and we are doing what is called a triple test. We are measuring uh, more than one of um, those elements. We put them together in order to form an educated opinion about the risk of having a baby that will carry genetic or uh, congenital um, malformations. We are measuring a protein that is called alpha fetoprotein that is secreted only during the pregnancy by the fetus will be abnormal uh, if the baby um, is not healthy. We can do the estriol test and the inhibit test, both hormones that are produced by the placenta. All those elements are totally abnormal, will not going to be found in a woman that is not uh, pregnant. We can perform an amniocentesis uh, that we are extracting a part of the amniotic fluid. And in the amniotic fluid, we will find cells from the baby because the baby's skin will uh, will slough and will be found, the cells will be found in the amniotic fluid and also the baby is swallowing uh, and breathing the amniotic fluid. So the amniotic fluid is pretty much um, flushing the inside of the body of the baby and cells will be eliminated to the outside. So they can be uh, analyzed uh, in terms of genetic components. We can uh, totally look into the uh, genetic material of the baby by um, extracting Amnio, uh, amniotic fluid. We can do what is called a karyotyping. Another procedure that we can, uh, through which we can um, have um, uh, cells from the uh, from the baby is by uh, performing what is called a chorionic villus sampling. Usually, this is performed instead of an amniocentesis um, at um, earlier stages of uh, pregnancy before the second trimester. Usually, between eight and 10 weeks of pregnancy. Uh, the amniocentesis is, uh, is performed later, uh, 14, 16, and sometimes 20 weeks of pregnancy. Um, however, uh, we need to understand that any kind of procedure that we are performing is carrying a certain risk. There is never a zero risk for those procedures. And um, that's the main concern for mo most of the mothers that this procedure may lead to, uh, to an abortion, a spontaneous abortion. This is an example of the, of the karyotype, and you can see um, how we do it. We literally can put down and map the chromosomes extracted from the, and photograph them. It, it's through a microscope, uh, and we can photograph them and uh, number them and see where there is an issue. Um, well, the cell will be um, stained with different stains, and um, you can see how they're uh, photographed and cut out. And in this example, you can see that um, this uh, individual has an extra 21 chromosome. You can see how small is the 21 uh, chromosome. All the now is what we can do regarding the genetic diseases. And by now, you already formed an idea that most of the genetic and congenital diseases have uh, repercussions, um, some of them tough repercussions, both in terms of mental and physical development of those babies. Um, so beside the counseling, we can, um, we have some, we have the ability of uh, limiting the repercussions just by knowing the disease and treating it as soon as possible and addressing it as soon as possible. For example, in a condition that is called the maple syrup urine disease, there is a, um, um, compromised metabolism of a protein in uh, in the body of the of the baby and um, along with eliminating those proteins from the baby's diet um, addition the addition of large um, doses of thiamine that supports the development of the nervous system will help preventing the repercussions the Wilson disease is characterized by an abnormal accumulation of copper in the tissues, and as a result of that, especially the deposits of copper in the nervous system will result in tremor and rigidity, um, and finally extensive liver damage uh, when it's deposited in the liver. Um, and in order to treat someone that has the Wilson disease, we are combining dietary and drug therapy. Uh, phenylketonuria, that we mentioned before, um, is easily managed by uh, diet um, by eliminating the phenylalanine from the um, diet of the um, of the baby. 
uh, definitely the future will bring uh, more and more um, technological uh, abilities to, to treat and diagnose this kind of uh, conditions. Um, we know by now that by adding vitamins and some hormones into the uh, diet of some of those conditions, uh, they will help and most probably the genetic engineering will uh, bring the ability of altering the cells to either produce what is missing or to correct any gene that prevents uh, a normal creation of the uh, of the proteins. What is the term for the genetic trait characterized by extra fingers or toes? A. Polypids. B. Polydactyly. C. Osteogenesis imperfecta. Or D. Neurofibromatosis. The term for the genetic trait characterized by extra fingers or toes is called polydactyly. 